Hey everybody, I'm continuing on page 322. The students are all taking their um, exams and they're at outside Professor Trelawney's classroom, the divination teacher who um, teaches about making predictions and seeing the future. And Ron just came out after taking his test and uh, he's tell talking to Harry about it. <clears throat> Finally, after about 20 minutes, Ron's large feet reappeared on the ladder. How'd it go? Harry asked him, standing up. Rubbish, said Ron. Couldn't see a thing, so I made some stuff up. Don't think she was convinced, though. Meet you in the common room, Harry muttered as Professor Trelawney's voice called, Harry Potter! The tower room was hotter than ever before. The curtains were closed, the fire was alight, and the usual sickly scent made Harry cough as he stumbled through the clutter of chairs and tables to where Professor Trelawney sat waiting for him before a large crystal ball. Good day, my dear, she said softly. If you would kindly gaze into the orb, take your time now, then tell me what you see within it. Harry bent over the crystal ball and stared, stared as hard as he could, willing it to show him something other than swirling white fog. But nothing happened. Well, Professor Trelawney prompted delicately, what do you see? The heat was overpowering and his nostrils were stinging with the perfume smoke wafting from the fire beside him. He thought of what Ron had just said and decided to pretend. Uh, said Harry, a dark shape? Um, what does it resemble? Whispered Professor Trelawney. Think now. Harry cast his mind around and it landed on Buckbeak. A hippogriff, he said firmly. Indeed, whispered, <coughs> excuse me whispered Professor Trelawney, scribbling keenly on the parchment perched upon her knees. My boy, you may well be seeing the outcome of poor Hagrid's trouble with the Ministry of Magic. Look closer. Does the hippogriff appear to have its head? Yes, said Harry firmly. Are you sure? Professor Trelawney urged him. Are you quite sure, dear? You don't see it writhing on the ground, perhaps, and a shadowy figure raising an axe behind it? No, said Harry, starting to feel slightly sick. No blood, no weeping Hagrid? No, said Harry again, wanting more than ever to leave the room in the heat. It looks fine. It's flying away. Professor Trelawney sighed. Well, dear, I think we'll leave it there. A little disappointing, but I'm sure you did your best. Relieved, Harry got up, picked up his bag, and turned to go. But then a loud, harsh voice spoke behind him. It will happen tonight. <clears throat> Harry wheeled around. Professor Trelawney had gone rigid in her armchair. Her eyes were unfocused and her mouth sagging. Uh, I'm sorry, said Harry. But Professor Trelawney didn't seem to hear him. Her eyes started to roll. Harry sat there in a panic. She looked as though she was about to have some sort of seizure. He hesitated, thinking of running to the hospital wing. And then Professor Trelawney spoke again in the same harsh voice, quite unlike her own. The Dark Lord lies alone and friendless, abandoned by his followers. His servant has been chained these twelve years. Tonight, before midnight, the servant will break free and set out to rejoin his master. The Dark Lord will rise again with his servant's aid, greater and more terrible than ever he was. Tonight, before midnight, the servant will set out to rejoin his master. Professor Trelawney's head fell forward onto her chest. She made a grunting sort of noise. Harry sat there staring at her. Then, quite suddenly, Professor Trelawney's head snapped up again. Oh, I'm so sorry, dear boy, she said dreamily. The heat of the day, you know. I drifted off for a moment. Harry sat there staring at her. Is there anything wrong, my dear? You you just told me that the Dark Lord's going to rise again, that his servant's going to go back to him. Professor Trelawney looked thoroughly startled. The Dark Lord? He who must not be named? My dear boy, that's hardly something to joke about. Rise again, indeed. But you just said it. You said the Dark Lord. I think you must have dozed off too, dear, said Professor Trelawney. I would certainly not presume to predict anything quite as far-fetched as that. Harry climbed back down the ladder and the spiral staircase, wondering. Had he just heard Professor Trelawney make a real prediction? Or had that been her idea of an impressive end to the test? Five minutes later, he was dashing past the security trolls outside the entrance to Gryffindor Tower, Professor Trelawney's words still resounding in his head. People were striding past him in the opposite direction, laughing and joking, heading for the grounds and a bit of long-awaited freedom. By the time he had reached the portrait hall and entered the common room, it was almost deserted. Over in the corner, however, sat Ron and Hermione. Professor Trelawney, Harry panted, just told me. 
but he stopped abruptly at the sight of their faces. Buckbeak lost, said Ron weakly. Hagrid's just sent this. Hagrid's note was dry this time. No tears had splattered it, yet his hand seemed to have shaken so much as he wrote with, that it was hardly legible. Lost appeal. They're going to execute at sunset. Nothing you can do. Don't come down. I don't want you to see it. Hagrid. We've got to go, said Harry at once. He can't just sit there on his own waiting for the executioner. Sunset, though, said Ron, who was staring out the window in a glazed sort of way. We'd never be allowed, especially you, Harry. Harry sank his head into his hands, thinking. If we only had the invisibility cloak. Where is it? said Hermione. Harry told her about leaving it in the passageway under the one-eyed witch. If Snape sees me anywhere near there again, I'm in serious trouble, he finished. That's true, said Hermione, getting to her feet. If he sees you. How do you open the witch's hump again? You you tap it and say descendium, said Harry, but... Hermione didn't wait for the rest of his sentence. She strode across the room, pushed open the fat lady's portrait, and vanished from sight. She hasn't gone to get it, Ron said, staring after her. She had. Hermione returned a quarter of an hour later, with the silvery cloak folded carefully under her robes. Hermione, I don't know what's gotten into you lately, said Ron, astounded. First you hit Malfoy, then you walk out on Professor Trelawney. Hermione looked rather flattered. They went down to dinner with everybody else, but did not return to Gryffindor Tower afterward. Harry had the cloak hidden down the front of his robes. He had to keep his arms folded to hide the lump. They skulked in an empty chamber off the entrance hall, listening, until they were sure it was deserted. They heard a last pair of people hurrying across the hall and a door slamming. Hermione poked her head around the door. Okay, she whispered. No one there. Cloak on. Walking very close together so that nobody would see them, they crossed the hall on tiptoe beneath the cloak, then walked down the stone front steps into the grounds. The sun was already sinking behind the forbidden forest, gliding, gilding the top branches of the trees. They reached Hagrid's cabin and knocked. He was a minute in answering, and when he did, he looked all around for his visitor, pale-faced and trembling. "'It's us!' Harry hissed. "'We're wearing the invisibility cloak. Let us in, and we can take it off.' "'You shouldn't have come!' Hagrid whispered. But he stood back, and they stepped inside. Hagrid shut the door quickly, and Harry pulled off the cloak. <clears throat> Hagrid was not crying, nor did he throw himself upon their necks. He looked like a man who did not know where he was or what to do. His helplessness was worse to watch than tears. "'Want some tea?' he said. His great hands were shaking as he reached for the kettle. "'Where's Buckbeak, Hagrid?' said Hermione hesitantly. "'I, I took him outside,' said Hagrid, spilling milk all over the table as he filled up the jug. "'He's tethered in me pumpkin patch.' Thought he ought to see the trees and smell fresh air before. Hagrid's hand trembled so violently that the milk jug slipped from his grasp and shattered all over the floor. I'll do it, Hagrid, said Hermione quickly, hurrying over and starting to clean up the mess. There's another one in the cupboard, Hagrid said, sitting down and wiping his forehead on his sleeve. Harry glanced at Ron, who looked back hopelessly. Isn't there anything anyone can do, Hagrid? Harry asked fiercely, sitting down next to him. Dumbledore? He's tried, said Hagrid. He's got no more power to overrule the committee. He told them Buckbeak's all right, but they're scared. You know what Lucius Malfoy's like. Threatened them, I expect. And the executioner, McNair, he's an old pal of Malfoy's, but it'll be quick and clean, and I'll be beside him. Hagrid swallowed. His eyes were darting all over the cabin as though looking for some shred of hope or comfort. Dumbledore's going to come down while it, while it happens. Wrote me this morning. Said he wants to, to be with me. Great man, Dumbledore. Hermione, who had been rummaging in Hagrid's cupboard for another milk jug, let out a small, quickly stifled sob. <clears throat> she straightened up with the new jug in her hands, fighting back tears. We'll stay with you too, Hagrid, she began, but Hagrid shook his shaggy head. You're to go back up to the castle. I told you I don't want you watching, and you shouldn't be down here anyway. If Fudge and Dumbledore catch you out without permission, Harry, you'll be in big trouble. Silent tears were now streaming down Hermione's face but she hid them from Hagrid, bustling around making tea. Then, as she picked up the milk bottle to pour some into the jug, she let out a shriek. Ron, I... I don't believe it! It's Scabbers! Ron gaped at her. What are you talking about? Hermione carried the milk jug over to the table and turned it upside down. With a frantic squeak and much scrambling to get back inside, Scabbers the rat came sliding out onto the table. Scabbers! said Ron blankly. Scabbers, what are you doing here? He grabbed the struggling rat and held him up to the light. Scabbers looked dreadful. He was thinner than ever. Large tufts of hair had fallen out, leaving wide, bald patches, and he writhed in Ron's hands as though desperate to free himself. 
It's okay, Scabbers, said Ron. No cats. There's nothing here to hurt you. Hagrid suddenly stood up, his eyes fixed on the window. His normally ruddy face had gone the color of parchment. They're coming. Harry, Ron, and Hermione whipped around. A group of men was walking down the distant castle steps. In front was Albus Dumbledore, his silver beard gleaming in the dying sun. Next to him trotted Cornelius Fudge. Behind them came the feeble old committee member and the executioner, McNair. You gotta go, said Hagrid. Every inch of him was trembling. They mustn't find you here. Go now. Ron stuffed scabbers into his pocket, and Hermione picked up the cloaks. I'll let you out the back way, said Hagrid. They followed him to the door into his back garden. Harry felt strangely unreal, and even more so when he saw Buckbeak a few yards away, tethered to a tree behind Hagrid's pumpkin patch. Buckbeak seemed to know something was happening. He turned his sharp head from side to side and pawed the ground nervously. It's okay, Beaky, said Hagrid softly. It's okay. He turned to Harry, Ron, and Hermione. Go on, he said. Get going. But they didn't move. Hagrid, we can't. We'll tell them what really happened. They can't kill him. Go, said Hagrid fiercely. It's bad enough without you lot in trouble and all. They had no choice. As Hermione threw the cloak over Harry and Ron, they heard voices at the front of the cabin. Hagrid looked at the place where they had just vanished from sight. Go quick, he said hoarsely. Don't listen. And he strode back into his cabin as someone knocked at the front door. Slowly, in a kind of horrified trance, Harry, Ron, and Hermione set off silently around Hagrid's house. As they reached the other side, the front door closed with a sharp snap. Please, let's hurry, Hermione whispered. I can't stand it. I can't bear it. They started up the sloping lawn toward the castle. The sun was sinking fast now. The sky had turned to a clear purple-tinged gray, but to the west there was a ruby-red glow. <clears throat> Ron stopped dead. Oh, please, Ron, Hermione began. It's Scabbers. He won't stay put. Ron was bent over, trying to keep Scabbers in his pocket, but the rat was going berserk, squeaking madly, twisting and flailing, trying to sink his teeth into Ron's hand. Scabbers, it's me, you idiot! It's Ron! Ron hissed. They heard a door open behind them in men's voices. Oh, Ron, please, let's move. They're going to do it, Hermione breathed. Okay, Scabbers, stay put! They walked forward. Harry, like Hermione, was trying not to listen to the rumble of voices behind them. Ron stopped again. I can't hold him. Scabbers, shut up. Everyone will hear us. The rat was squealing wildly, but not loudly enough to cover up the sounds drifting from Hagrid's garden. There was a jumble of indistinct male voices, a silence, and then, without warning, the unmistakable swish and thud of an axe. Hermione swayed on the spot. They did it, she whispered to Harry. I, I don't believe it. They did it. Poor Hagrid and um, Buckbeak. Okay. So we are on chapter 17, Cat, Rat, and Dog. Harry's mind had gone blank with shock. The three of them stood transfixed with horror under the invisibility cloak. The very last rays of the setting sun were casting a bloody light over the long-shadowed grounds. Then behind them, they heard a wild howling. Hagrid, Harry muttered. Without thinking about what he was doing, he made to turn back, but both Ron and Hermione seized his arms. We can't, said Ron, who was paper white. He'll be in worse trouble if they know we've been to see him. Hermione's breathing was shallow and uneven. How could they? She choked. How could they? Come on, said Ron, whose teeth seemed to be chattering. They set off back toward the castle, walking slowly to keep themselves hidden under the cloak. The light was fading fast now. By the time they reached open ground, darkness was settling like a spell around them. Scabbers, keep still, Ron hissed, <coughs> clamping his hand over his chest. The rat was wriggling madly. Ron came to a sudden halt, trying to force Scabbers deeper into his pocket. What's the matter with you, you stupid rat? Stay still! Ouch, he bit me! Ron, be quiet, Hermione whispered urgently. Fudge will be out here in a minute. He won't stay put. Scabbers was plainly terrified. He was writhing with all his might, trying to break free of Ron's grip. What's the matter with him? But Harry had just seen, slinking toward them, his body low to the ground, wide yellow eyes glinting eerily in the darkness. Crookshanks. Whether he could see them or was following the sound of Scabber's squeaks, Harry couldn't tell. Crookshanks, Hermione moaned. No, go away, Crookshanks, go away. But the cat was getting nearer. Scabbers, no! Too late. The rat had slipped between Ron's clutching fingers, hit the ground, and scampered away. In one bound, Crookshanks sprang after him, and before Harry or Hermione could stop him, Ron had thrown the invisibility cloak off himself and pelted away into the darkness. Ron, Hermione called. She and Harry looked at each other, then followed it at a sprint. It was impossible to run full out under the cloak. 
They pulled it off and it streamed behind them like a banner as they hurtled after Ron. They could hear his feet thundering along ahead and his shouts at Crookshanks.